University of Queensland will be presenting um, this presentation on behalf of Jay Higman, which is titled Probe Naming Performance as a Predictor of Ammonia Treatment Success. Thanks very much. So, um, first off, I'd like to apologise for not being Jade. Um, she couldn't make it, so I'm filling in. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge, so this is primarily her work, along with the team. I think Penny Burfin is in the audience. Uh, Errol McKinnon was in a car, but is now here. And Kate O'Brien's been in a car for the last five hours. And he's not here yet. But, uh, she should get here by dinner. So um, we've already heard uh, this morning around um, the fact that response to word retrieval treatment in aphasia is highly variable, and we lack methods for accurately predicting how an individual will respond uh, to therapy. It's also unclear how differences in treatment intensity and in control for the amount of therapy will actually influence uh, treatment response. So these are two of the things um, we'll be talking about today. And some of this you may have heard before based on Jay's earlier published work. If you have, you can just start thinking about what you're going to have for lunch. Um, so intensity in this way is, there's a, a number of ways that the term is used, but we're looking at it in terms of the dose or total amount of treatment over the duration of treatment. And there's limited consensus around uh, what high intensity phasia rehab might look like. So whether it's five hours a week, 20 hours a week or more. Um, similar to what uh, standard practice is, clearly a lot of standard practice is not uh, highly intense. But there are examples of this. But we've also got recommendations in a number of uh, guidelines that aphasia therapy should be intensive. And this has a lot of implications for management. So if we have 20 hours that we can provide for an individual, should we be putting it in a very short period of time, like a boot camp of some sort, or should we be spreading it out? And so the recent uh, Cochrane review uh, by Marion Brady looked at one of the issues they looked at was intensity. And one of the conclusions was that uh, treatments of a higher intensity might provide more of a benefit for people with aphasia. Um, however, this again speaks to this issue of uh, there being some lack of clarity around what we're talking about when we're talking about intensity and whether it's confounded by dose. So this is the studies that were um, showing better outcomes for high intensity therapy. And this is the high intensity arm and the low intensity arms. And often, we're also looking at uh, high dose versus low dose. So in almost all studies that are used for this, we're getting a lot more therapy overall in the high intensity arm. <clears throat> in those two studies that did control for dose and just changed the intensity, one actually compared different types of therapy, so it's hard to make conclusions there. And the one that did have the same um, form of therapy, there was no significant difference in primary outcome measures. Um, so from this, I think we need to step back and think about how we're actually turning studies as being high intensity and uh, also controlling for dose. So while there has been this emphasis on intensity um, based on principles of neuroplasticity, often derived from animal studies, we also know in healthy humans uh, that there is something that uh, appears to be a benefit, particularly in forms of learning, which is the opposite in some ways. And this is where you get the distributed practice effect. So spacing out um, opportunities for learning uh, can lead to improved consolidation of memory. And this can happen if you're wanting to learn how to golf while you're up here on the coast, or if you're wanting to learn a language. Um, so spacing out um, the period between which you get exposures to the new forms of representations can actually improve long-term uh, benefits. So there, these are two opposing uh, views. So Jade's work had 
looked at what happens when we control for the total amount of therapy. So if they're getting 48 hours of therapy, and this is using the aphasia lift program. What happens when we look at it over three weeks, three weeks versus eight weeks? And it was a non-randomized trial based on um, geographic location. So it was a state of origin of some sort. <laughs> People who are from overseas, this is one of our national sports where men dress up as cockroaches or cane toads <laughs> and wrestle each other. It's very popular. Um, that's actually not too far from the truth, actually. Uh, sorry, Linda, I'm going to be rugby league. Um, so, we had 34 participants. Uh, they were all chronic, and we compared them directly. What they got was um, three to four hours a day in the high intensity and D-lift refers to distributed practice. So they got one to two hours per day for three, three to four days a week, and the high intensity they got five days per week. So in the end, we ended up then with 48 hours over both arms in either three weeks or eight weeks. And Jade's published the work, uh, so this was in stroke, looking at measures of impairment, so confrontation learning on the BMT, showed both groups improved as a function of therapy, but the distributed lift uh, cohort showed um, superior naming both post-therapy and at follow-up. Um, however, there weren't significant differences, so we got improvements on both in terms of proxy rate and communicative effectiveness and SETI, and in terms of communication-related quality of life on the assessment for living with aphasia. So there's a mixed finding in terms of whether um, intensity, high intensity versus uh, less high intensity, has an impact across different uh, domains. So in this, um, we've now started looking more specifically at treated and untreated items that were used within this trial. So we gave three baseline naming probes um, from a large cohort, and then we picked uh, 48 items that were unable to name accurately and then randomized these for treatment. And they were matched on all the usual suspects for psychomagistic Actors that matter for naming. <coughs> then they received 14 hours of uh, word retrieval treatment, which included a combination of semantic feature analysis, phonological components analysis, and an additional 14 hours of computer based therapy that looked at these treated items using uh, step by step and tasks like repetition in the presence of the picture, confrontation, and, and hearing. They then also had 14 hours of functional therapy, including scripting, role plays, and functional goals and supporting communication. So what we observed firstly in terms of just treatment for uh, the items that were selected was that in both the lift, um, so this is pre-treatment, post-treatment in red, and follow-up in blue, so both the lift and the distributed lift, so three, three weeks versus eight weeks, therapy um, had a significant impact in both arms um, for treated items. And when we looked at individual stats, uh, it was a significant improvement for 12 out of 16 participants in the lift arm and 14 out of 16 <laughs> distributed lift arm here. For follow-up, it was 9 out of 16 for lift and 12 out of 15 for D-lift, so we had one uh, that wasn't able to do the follow-up. And then when we look at untreated items, again we got an effective therapy, um, but on an individual level um, there's less of an effect, so 2 out of 16 lift participants and 7 out of 16 dealing participants making an improvement and again this um, favoured to some degree uh, the distributed lift when you're looking at individual stats. So the second 